spoiler warning. The following is an in-depth analysis. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before watching this review. Sin City is a tough animal to discuss on Superhero Rewind for a couple reasons. First, it isn't a superhero film. Let's get that out of the way right now. But it's clearly influenced comic book films in the whole, including superhero movies. It includes a lot of superhero movie alums like Bruce Willis, who did Unbreakable, Jessica Alba from the Fantastic Four films, and Michael Clark Duncan from Daredevil. And it includes a lot of larger-than-life heroic protagonists who put their lives on the line to save the helpless. Now, I'm not arguing that makes it a superhero film, but it makes it worth talking about along with other movies where the good guys are clearly the good guys and the bad guys are clearly the bad guys. Also, Marv is arguably super-powered. I know that's never explicitly stated in the movie, but the guy can do a lot of things nobody else can, and he takes a lot more punishment. We'll get there. The second reason is that it's tough to do an in-depth analysis on, like other narrative modes that deviate from traditional literary fiction, many we've covered, such as parody and farce. Sin City is essentially a melodrama, which is what the early noirs were called until film noir became a widely accepted term in the 1970s, and therefore doesn't allow for the same kind of dissection and criticism I usually do. By the way, Sin City isn't generally considered film noir, sometimes it's called neo-noir, because though it's still disputed among scholars, by and large, Noir seems to have become a definition for that early period of hard-boiled detective stories shot in a post-German expressionist style from the 40s and 50s. Anyway, I can't expect three-dimensional characters with internal conflict that allows us to explore them as real human beings, and I can't expect them to have an opportunity for change because melodrama is something else entirely. I have often described characters I feel are written ineffectively in dramatic superhero films as melodramatic, meaning they come off as flat and unbelievable, often reacting too emotionally to situations that don't warrant it. One of them was, ironically, Susan Storm from the Fantastic Four movies. But you can't complain about characters being melodramatic dramatic in melodrama, the same tradition noirs came out of, and what Sin City is, of course, aspiring to be, or aspiring to celebrate, or probably both. By definition, melodrama is about the story itself, rather than the story growing organically from its characters. The story is driven by the characters' emotions, and those emotions don't come from internal conflicts, but rather are there to facilitate the plot. Characters in Sin City and other melodramas don't question their convictions or their actions. They simply respond in extremely emotional ways to extreme situations. There isn't a principal character in Sin City who's not proactive. That's one of the things I really enjoy about it. Even though I prefer those complex character studies where a protagonist is put in situations where it's difficult to make the right choice, one of the pitfalls in a lot of bad or mediocre drama is the reactionary protagonist who never takes charge of his own destiny but manages to save the day anyway, sometimes totally by accident. So so while the idea of melodrama doesn't immediately jazz me, I do like how the characters are forced by the mode to be instantly proactive. Still, how do you do an in-depth analysis of a movie in a narrative mode that is intentionally not character-driven? Of course, it is intensely rich visually, because the comic book was used as a direct storyboard with its incredible noir style where the only colors we see besides black and white are the colors Miller wants us to see, and often with a purpose. He does this with digital coloration and a lot of digital backdrops. And it's also extremely violent and very erotic, so much so that it was quite the editing job finding clips I could get away with using. But while it's a high-concept piece and unabashedly unrealistic, I don't find it to be just style with no substance. Thematically, it's about self-worth and observing what these general character stereotypes need to feel relevant and accomplished, with heavy attention naturally on gender. There's a lot of symbolism in the film. Likeable characters, despite their being intentional stereotypes. Characters who have reasons for what they do, and those motivations consistently seem to be observations of the most blatant of human emotions and behaviors, with particular emphasis on violence. I find I like the film because I'm captivated by this rich universe Frank Miller and Robert Rodriguez explore through these vignettes, and how they expertly weave these stories together in a logical and interesting way. The stereotypes all come together to make something truly unique. Robert Rodriguez had a heck of a time convincing Frank Miller to make this movie, and he started working on it even before he had the rights to it. He wanted to show Miller that the movie could be made to look like his comic, and that he didn't just want to make an adaptation, but in his word, a translation. He says in the Making of featurette on the DVD that he didn't want to make Robert Rodriguez's Sin City, he wanted to make Frank Miller's Sin City. So he got Frank Miller to come with him when he shot a three-minute short film in just ten hours on a green screen, which ultimately became the actual movie's opening vignette. Once Miller became, as he puts it, seduced and decided to work alongside Rodriguez to make the movie. They used that scene to convince A-list actors like Bruce Willis to come aboard the project. 
By the end, Miller had put so much input on the set that Rodriguez wanted Miller to have a co-directing credit and even quit the Directors Guild just so that could happen, even willing to take his own name off the movie if need be. Rodriguez used the comic as the movie's storyboard and shot it exactly as he saw it on the page. In 2005, Sin City was widely considered the most faithful adaptation of a comic to screen, given that it's done panel for panel, and the only comic book movie to achieve the same level of faithfulness to the original that I know of since then is 300, another Frank Miller property. There's only very minor dialogue cut or changed for the film, so unchanged that the movie doesn't even have a writer or screenplay credit. It's just Frank Miller's Sin City. So really, if you've seen this movie, you know these stories. If you sit down and read them, they're the same. This is the movie's greatest strength. You've got all these huge, well-known actors, and I'm seeing Frank Miller's drawings, not the actors, through the whole movie. This is the only movie I've ever seen with Bruce Willis where I didn't see Bruce Willis. I mean, sure, I recognize him, I know it's him, but in this digitally rendered world, speaking this over-the-top dialogue, he completely becomes Hardigan. And some of these actors are nearly unrecognizable because they visually and emotionally transform into these comic book characters. A lot of people point to Marv. The makeup job is so well done, you have to keep reminding yourself you're looking at Mickey. Rourke. The one that always gets me is that Kevin, the cannibal in the Marv story, is Elijah Wood, with that horrifying, psychotic smile and those glasses that are often white so you can't see behind them. He's a completely different person. The reason Rodriguez calls this a translation and not an adaptation is that he strove not to make Sin City a movie, but to make the movie a comic book. Not only does most of the movie look like live-action versions of Miller's drawings, but several scenes are Frank Miller's drawings, animated, moving silhouettes, like the one of the salesman and the customer kissing in The Customer is Always Right at the beginning. I think Rodriguez and Miller did amazing work in making a film look and feel like a comic book. And I get why Rodriguez tries to get away from the word adaptation, because that implies it's somebody else's interpretation of the work, like Zack Snyder's Watchmen, which, although I really admire that film, and I feel it's quite faithful to the themes and intentions of the original, it's definitely Zack Snyder's Watchmen and not Alan Moore's. At the same time, calling it one thing doesn't make it something else. If Rodriguez just wanted this to be a comic book, he could pick up the comic book. It's already there. The difference between it and nearly every other adaptation of comic books to movies is that it's a literal one. But there's still different experiences. The pacing in a comic is different from the pacing in a film, because it changes from person to person. You can linger on a panel as long as you'd like, study it, consider it, marvel at it, and move on. In a film, you can only linger on a scene or frame as long as the director allows you to. And as close as the characters get to what they are on the printed page, the film will never give you the freedom to use your imagination in the same way the comic does. You might have had a very different voice in your head for Marv than the one Mickey Rourke used. To be fair, having Miller co-direct probably gets this the closest to the voices he had in his own head, so that makes it more authentic, but it changes the way we perceive the story. If both versions of a property are good, they're both worth experiencing in different ways. For my money, I'm glad this movie got made, because I actually haven't cared for what Little Sin City I've read as comic books. I think Frank Miller's art here actually looks better as a starting piece for a movie than it looks on the page, and adding in the traditional noir jazz score and hearing the voiceovers like classic noir always had, rather than reading them in narration boxes, is actually more effective to me. Of course, I love the experience of reading comic books, but for my taste, these stories are more effective in this medium. Other people might prefer experiencing this in that pulp comic style. They're still two very different experiences, and since the movie was made right, they're both equally valid to me. I should also note that some comics don't translate straight panel for panel. This isn't to say that every movie based on a comic should be made this way, but this is a mode that definitely works that way. The one really different and creative thing the movie does apart from the comics is in its structure. The order of the vignettes, which isn't done straight up chronologically, tells us things in the order it wants us to know them, to affect how we perceive this world. There's a very clear logic to the order, and they're tied together in really clever ways. The first story sets up the world and its themes, establishes that violence and sex run this city, and in the character of the salesman, we get a blend of the good and the bad male stereotypes we'll be inundated with through the rest of the movie. The good guys want to save women, the bad guys want to hurt them. This guy saves a woman by killing her. This story is called The Customer is Always Right, and I have to admit that what exactly is going on here, beyond just setting the tone and visual style, was lost on me the first couple times I saw it, and I couldn't quite put my finger on what I'll catch her check in the morning means in the man's narration at the end. 
Once you know the title, it's clearer. She's running from something, and although she seems at first not to see it coming, as he tells her he'll save her, he actually hired the man to kill her to get her away from whatever she's running from. This is one of my only real complaints about the movie. When you're reading the comic stories, you know the titles of them, and that informs what you're reading. If we haven't read this story, and given that it's presented panel for panel on screen, we certainly aren't expected to, we don't have that title to help inform the ending. I think those titles could have been integrated into the film itself, either as titles between stories or somewhere on the screen as the stories begin. But that first story doesn't include any characters we'll see again until the very end. Each vignette after this introduces or calls back to other characters and ideas in the other stories. Multiple viewings really help you see how it all fits together. For instance, we see 11-year-old Nancy from Hardigan's story in Marv's, now all grown up and an exotic dancer. She helps Marv, and we see that there's more to her than just a dancer. This establishes where she is now so that when Hardigan finds her again, in the second part of his story, we already know who she is and what she's been doing for the eight years she writes letters to Hardigan in prison. In Marv's story, Dwight and Shelley are introduced. We see them flirting, and we don't realize yet that this will be a major part of the plot for the next story. We also jump into Dwight's perspective for a moment as he looks at Marv and his narration about how Marv is a man who would have been more comfortable in another time, as a gladiator. We don't know why we're in his head so briefly, and it's a little jarring on first viewing until we realize he's one of our major players, and he's going to get his own story. We don't always know why those characters will be important when they're introduced like that, and sometimes they're just there to indicate time, when this story happens in relation to the others. But it's what ties them all together and justifies this as one film rather than short films shown together. The structure does emulate reading a comic to a degree, like reading short stories in a pulp magazine, but more tied together. This isn't heavy metal. There's not just some glowing green orb thing at the beginning and end that sort of ties everything together. These stories serve to paint a full picture of Sin City by the end. Each of the vignettes themselves holds to a particular formula. They're plot-driven stories about men trying to save women from other bad men. Each is a mystery, but they're not whodunit stories necessarily. What I find fascinating about the story structure is that each one does exactly the same thing, and yet I find them each unpredictable as I'm watching them. Each story starts with a question or a mission to throw us off from the real mystery, some big unexpected plot twist, which we and the protagonists don't learn until it's too late, and the main conflict arises from the plot twist. In the first Hardigan story, titled That Yellow Bastard Part 1, we think it's about whether Hardigan will be able to rescue the little girl from a rapist, from Rourke Jr., but he does that relatively easily. The plot twist is that his partner, Bob, who he knocked out earlier so Bob couldn't call for backup, and incidentally so we wouldn't suspect him, has been paid off to let Rourke conduct his nasty business, and so Bob shoots Hardigan in the back. In Marv's story, The Hard Goodbye, we think it's a murder mystery. Who killed Goldie, the woman who is kind to Marv and who he's trying to avenge? But again, he discovers that earlier than we might expect. The real mystery is who is the woman who looks just like Goldie trying to kill Marv. He thinks she's a hallucination because he sometimes gets confused without his medicine, but she turns out to be Goldie's twin sister, mistakenly thinking Marv killed her. In Dwight's story, The Big Fat Kill, we think it's just another story about a man trying to protect a woman who's being mistreated. It starts out that way, but Dwight kills Jackie the gutless jerk who beat Shelley, and the plot twist is that Jackie was a cop, and the prostitutes in Old Town killing him will destroy their truce with the cops if Jackie's body is discovered. The cops who let them run their own ring in Old Town as long as the two sides stay away from each other. And even the second part of Hardigan's story, which really is a second story all to itself, begins with us and Hardigan thinking Rourke Jr., the yellow bastard now, has gotten to Nancy, when in fact, it's revealed that her weekly letter is not coming in the finger they sent to his cellar just bluffs, and that he himself leads Rourke right to Nancy. Like the comic, a lot of the story is told through narration. This is a major element of melodrama and works here in a way it doesn't in traditional drama. These characters almost literally wear their emotions on their sleeves, and they tell us exactly what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and consequentially what the themes of their stories are in these voiceovers. You could close your eyes and listen to this movie rather than watching it, and you'd know exactly what the protagonist knows. The visual elements of the storytelling are all there for our benefit colors and objects that signify theme or emotion, but whenever our heroes pick up on those, they come right out in the narration and tell us about it, like the salesman does when he mentions the customer's green eyes. 
There are a lot of repeated lines and narrations. Sometimes a line will bookend a vignette to really drive home its idea, and sometimes a line will even be used by multiple characters over multiple stories. One of the major ones, which Marv has first, and the salesman says again at the end, is turn the right corner in Sin City and you can find just about anything. This city runs on crime. The police are almost all corrupt, and that means a lot of people can get away with anything. So on the one hand, it's dangerous and it's terrifying, especially for women, but on the other hand, it's a savage land where anything goes, which means you can get your hands on whatever you want if you know what you're doing. A cannibal can get a psychotic but powerful cardinal to support his insane crimes by making him think killing and eating prostitutes is God's work. A woman looking for a way out can pay for assisted suicide. Another repeated line which comes up actually more than twice is fair trade. This is probably the most important one because commerce is a big thing in this movie. What is a character willing to give up for what he wants or what he needs? Most of the women in this film sell their bodies in some way, either as prostitutes or as exotic dancers in order to survive. They live in a man's world. The evil men who run things are the Rourke brothers, one an evil politician with unlimited power and the other an evil religious man man with unlimited power, so they've got every base covered. They're each introduced in different stories. Cardinal Rourke, played by one of my favorite typecast bad guy actors, Rutger Hauer, who played Mr. Earl in Batman Begins, thinks prostitutes are evil and slaughters them, while Senator Rourke, whose son is the Yellow Bastard, allows men to treat women as property because it keeps him in power. The bad men aren't fair and constantly try to get something for nothing. Michael Clark Duncan's character, Minute, calls Dwight's proposal, Jackie's head for Gale, a fair trade but he doesn't really mean it and tries to double-cross Dwight. The heroes in the film are self-sacrificial, with the exception of Dwight, who helps women who can actually help themselves and fights alongside them instead of for them. Hardigan and Marv give up their lives for women, either to protect the woman or, in Marv's case, to avenge one. Hardigan actually does this twice. We think he's dead after his first vignette when he says, an old man dies and a little girl lives. Fair trade. He survives this in order to do it again just as many of the women sell their lives in a way to survive, our heroes sell their lives for women they care about. Their self-sacrifice is a big part of their stereotype, and it's why we're supposed to root for them. The villain's greed and their view of women as objects, their being the reason these women are forced to use themselves as currency, is why we're supposed to hate them. Remember, these are exaggerated stereotypes meant to observe real ideas and problems that exist, obviously to differing degrees in reality. In Hardigan's last story, he talks a lot about proving that he's, quote, worth a damn. How these characters define their worth is also a major element of the stereotypes. Our heroes rebuke villains for being cowards. The yellow bastard has to rape little girls to feel like a man. Jack has to beat up Shelley and lie about it as it's happening, spinning every wrong action of his as her fault. Several times he tells her that she's mad at him for no reason, and it's not his fault that she's sleeping around on him, when in reality, she wants nothing to do with him and is trying to get away. Again, he does this to feel like a man. I should point out here that apparently the customer in the first story has a similar backstory, which Frank Miller reveals in the DVD commentary, though it isn't in the comic or the film, and so doesn't really inform the story. But if it was there, it's very consistent. The customer is running from her mob boss boyfriend because she tried to leave him and get caught with another man. The mob boss threatens to kill her in some brutal fashion, so she goes to the salesman to die a quick and painless death. Sound familiar? The women seem to measure their self-worth by being independent and not needing a man's help, cursing themselves whenever they do. That makes a lot of sense in a modern melodrama. Sometimes these women need men, but I don't think that's Frank Miller saying women can't protect themselves. I mean, look at the prostitutes at Old Town. It's just part of this universe. This corrupt city is set up to make women subservient to men. So even while Nancy has the classic complex where she falls in love with her hero, regardless of his advanced age, she still gets mad at herself for needing his protection. Then you've got Marv's parole officer, Lucille, the woman who tries to put herself on equal footing with men in power, tries to live in that world, and fails miserably. She's a lesbian, which seems to be a point to make her more masculine than the other women in the film. Even the old town prostitutes feel very effeminate by comparison. Lethal, but effeminate. She's a police officer, but very low on the food chain, and no matter how hard she tries to live like a man, she still becomes a victim along with the other girls Kevin kidnaps and cannibalizes. Marv saves her, but not before Kevin eats one of her hands off. By the way, that was genuinely terrifying to me. 
Ugh. Anyway, her final fate is to be gunned down by a fellow police officer completely unnecessarily. This city has hard and fast rules about gender rules. The men are in charge, the women, even the deadly women of Old Town serve them in one way or another. It's only in Hardigan's last story that we see a glimmer of hope that this city may one day change, and importantly, that optimism is possible because of his self-sacrifice, the bravery in standing up for women that makes him worthwhile in his own mind. And that takes us back to the structure of the vignettes. That Yellow Bastard Part 2, Hardigan's last story, actually takes place before Marv's story, as indicated by our seeing Marv at the bar in this story, and we know that he has gotten the electric chair by the end of his. My guess is that Dwight's story also happens after this, that it's actually the last story besides The Customer is Always Right Part 2, but there's nothing to really indicate that, and it's not especially important. At any rate, the stories are given to us in the order Miller wants us to see them. So we have to see these bad men taking advantage of women and the few good men having to sacrifice themselves for what's right before we're given this hint of optimism which actually chronologically has already happened. Hardigan kills the yellow bastard and that means Senator Rourke has no bloodline left. As his family dies off, there's a chance that Sin City can change, can get to a point where it's no longer running on sex and violence. And Hardigan's suicide at the end ensures there's no reason for Senator Rourke to go after Nancy now as leverage to get to him. All of these characters make up a greater whole, and that's what the movie is really about, Sin City itself. The one fully realized character is the city, and Hardigan's actions at the end are really the city's opportunity for change. The characters are like aspects to a personality personality that's been corrupted by darkness but still has some good in there somewhere represented by our heroes. The city isn't just evil and there's hope for it and while even in the midst of all this corruption, there are consequences for bad actions. Even Marv, one of our heroes, has to face the music at the end of his story for everyone he's killed. We sympathize with his quest to avenge the woman who was kind to him and I find myself laughing more than I think I should when he's killing bad men to get to the truth. <laughs> My favorite Marv line is I love hit men. No matter what you do to them you don't feel bad. But regardless, he does murder people, albeit only bad people, and one could argue that he deserves some sort of punishment for that. But like Hardigan, when he allows himself to be incarcerated for eight years without signing a confession, convicted for raping Nancy, even though he's the one that saved her, it's a price he's willing to pay for what he believes in. At this point, I want to address the two most common negative criticisms reviewers had of this film when it first came out. The first one is that the film is lacking in humanity. I'm not sure how Rodriguez and Miller could have adapted Miller's comic and made them more human stories. Again, we're dealing with the kind of storytelling that plays by different rules than the traditional narrative. I think you have to know you're looking at melodrama. Whether or not melodrama is really an art or really worthwhile, whether the original Sin City comics were really worthwhile, I suppose might be debatable. But getting a faithful Sin City movie and expecting deep character drama is like ordering a ham steak and expecting veal. Still, I find that I really like characters like Hardigan and Marv, and I think they're memorable. I think Miller is trying to show us why we like these stereotypes. Hardigan always does the right thing. He pushes through pain and he never complains. He's noble and puts other people first. Marv is big and dumb and lovable. He hurts people, but he has his own set of standards, only killing when he thinks he has a really good reason. And he loves what he does, so we love watching him do it. Dwight is a crazy person who's murdered people, though we don't know who or why, of course, and focuses his madness on helping his friends. He's fun to watch because of moments like when the man he kills at the beginning talks to him. It's fun to see him try to fix his problems and help people while also wrestling with madness. So no, these people don't act like real people, and they're not supposed to. It's melodrama. But I think they also have clear motivations, and they find people they really care about. The second criticism is that our heroes kill without remorse. This is an extreme, unrealistic world where violence is the way of life, and a lot of people have to do violence just to survive. Larger-than-life characters like Hardigan and Marv become hardened by the lives they've led. They're used to all this violence, so yes, they can kill and move on. But they don't just kill whoever or whenever. Each character who kills does so with purpose. Even when Dwight and the prostitutes murder all those gang members in Old Town, they're enjoying it not because killing is fun, but because they're taking their turf back and ensuring their own safety, and they're doing it for the purpose of showing the mob boss how much he lost in trying to mess with Old Town. It's a violence-driven movie, and certainly more so than you could get away with in traditional narrative, I think, but it's also a movie about violence, and there's hope at the end that the city might eventually become less violence-driven. I also don't think it's always the case that these characters kill without remorse. With that line Marv has about hitmen, 
he implies that sometimes when he hurts or kills people, he does feel bad. Hardigan is forced to kill a cop toward the end on the Rourke farm, which is the closest the movie ever gets to an internal conflict. He says in his voiceover, hate yourself later. These are small moments in an otherwise brutal movie, certainly, but they're there. With those moments and considering violence as consequences, I can't look at this movie as just violence for the sake of violence. At the same time, I certainly understand that criticism. After all, a lot of the humor in this movie, and it is a surprisingly funny movie on top of all of its grittiness and stylized gore, comes from the violence. Maybe my favorite line in the whole movie is, she didn't quite cut his head off, she made a Pez dispenser out of him. Yay for stories completely lost in time, which works here in a way it didn't in the spirit. Anyway, Miller finds a way to make me laugh at these scenes, when I usually resist this kind of thing, and I'm impressed that he can do that. But there are people who just watch violent movies for the sake of violence, and I don't understand that. Those viewers probably aren't finding all these interesting connections and repeated themes and all these elements that create this really interesting world I can't help but enjoy living in for a couple hours. I read a comment on a website years ago that really bothered me. It was a message board speculating about a Spawn sequel. Still not holding my breath on that one. And the comment said, I hope this one's more brutal than the last. If that's really why some people watch these movies, I can see why critics are worried about a movie like this that isn't dripping with humanity. What it has going for it beyond people getting shot and hacked up would probably be totally lost on those people. The biggest problem with having characters that are defined by the world they live in is that their background is rendered unimportant. Marv and Dwight are said to have dark pasts. They're each murderers, but we don't know how they got that way. All that matters for the short story ahead is who they are now. We don't even get a glimpse of their backstories beyond whatever is relevant, like Dwight's fling with Gale, the leader of the Old Town Prostitutes. And so we don't know things I'd like to know, like how Marv is so powerful. He really seems to have superpowers. Even in this over-the-top world where everyone can take more bullets, take more beatings, take more falls from high places than real people can, this guy can do a lot more, including getting run over by cars, getting shot in the head and only blacks out, and it takes three times Times more electricity to kill him when he gets to the chair than it would a normal person. A lot of attention is placed on these incredible abilities, but we aren't told where they come from. I think it's decently consistent because he's the only one who can do these things. That implies there's probably a reason, and we don't get it because it's not deemed relevant to the story. Still, it takes me out of the story a bit because I keep wanting to know, and the first time I saw the film, thought maybe we'd get an answer. My best guess is that Marv is a product of some kind of genetic engineering. We know experimental medicine causes strange side effects, given Rourke Jr.'s transformation into the Yellow Bastard, but that doesn't scream eugenics. Anyway, it's definitely something I was yearning to find out. I'll briefly mention some of the color symbolism I noticed. The emotions are all right on the surface, and so is the symbolism. One negative review I read complained that the text is the subtext which, in my mind, is a pretty decent definition of melodrama. That would only be a problem if this movie was trying to pass itself off as something else, and it isn't. So if you were going to add splashes of color to represent emotion in the middle of a noir-esque piece, why not make that symbolism as blatant as the emotions themselves? So in the first story, the woman wears red, which tells us, of course, that there's violence in her life. Without Miller's commentary, you don't know what she's running from, but either she's killed someone, or the blood red signifies she's about to die. Turns out to be the latter. Her eyes flash green, which is sometimes used to denote deviousness. I've seen it mostly in female villains, so that tells us maybe she's done something wrong, that she's not completely innocent. Goldie's hair is obviously gold, and that signifies perfection, or rather, the perfect way Marv sees her. Probably the most blatant use of color symbolism is the yellow bastard himself. He's a coward, and yellow is the color for cowardice. There are also a lot of symbolic objects, probably my favorite being the earrings the girls in Old Town wear, each signifying something about that girl's personality. Miho wears ninja stars on her earrings. She's silent and deadly, and incidentally also throws a lot of ninja stars, sometimes shaped like swastikas. I don't know if there's any actual reason for the swastikas, other than it being pretty hilarious when Jackie's crawling along the ground with a metal swastika sticking out of his behind and yelling, NOBODY LAUGH! Becky's earrings are an ironic foreshadowing. She wears crosses, and this is another perversion of religion, because she turns out not to be innocent at all, as her paraphernalia would suggest. She's the one who rats out Old Town to the mob, and at the end of the film, in the bookending second salesman appearance, we're left to believe that she's hired the salesman to kill her as atonement for what she did to her friends. We don't see that, so we're not entirely sure. Sometimes these visual symbols don't even make practical sense, like the bed in Marv's hotel room when he sleeps with Goldie. It's shaped like a giant red heart, 
and that indicates that sex, for once in this movie, is kind of a good thing, as it's the cause of a lot of sadness and death everywhere else. Granted, it turns out Goldie was a prostitute and slept with Marv not to be kind to him, or because other women won't have him due to his physical appearance, like he thinks at first, but because she thinks he can protect her. You could almost say she's paying him for services that will be rendered later. But that motivation isn't a sinister one, and Marv doesn't blame her even when he finds that out. One of the things we're supposed to latch onto about Marv is that he has this memory of the perfect woman. That's what he's avenging, and nothing can take that away from him. But anyway, this bed. What's it doing in this gross, dingy, condemned-looking hotel room? But a melodrama doesn't care if it's realistic. It's there for a thematic purpose. I think it's really interesting the impact this movie has had on action movies and comic book films, given its relatively small budget, only $40 million. It wasn't a huge success compared to other comic book films, but it made money. It only did $74 million domestically. I love how such a small movie can leave such a big impact, and it has a lot to do with Rodriguez's commitment to Miller's work and his love of it. This guy convinced Tarantino to guest direct the scene with Dwight and dead Jackie in the car when it gets pulled over. Given how often this movie is compared to Pulp Fiction and their similar story structures, it's pretty impressive that they got him involved, instantly giving this some credibility. Though some critics, unfairly I'd say, still complain that it ripped off Pulp Fiction. So yeah, I don't know how to do a story analysis of a movie like this. All I can really do is make observations, just as Miller seems to be doing. Now, I'm not a huge Frank Miller fan. Sometimes his sensibilities are a bit lost on me, but I can't deny how overwhelmingly entertaining I found this film. It's expertly plotted, the vignettes are cleverly organized, and it's brilliantly cast. No one feels out of place, and even Jessica Alba, who I don't usually care for, completely becomes Nancy Callahan, just as Bruce Willis becomes John Hartigan. The one fully realized character in the film is Sin City itself, and when it's over, I feel like I know that character through and through, and I'm totally immersed in it. I'm giving Sin City a 4 out of 4. Join me next week as I review a movie well off the beaten path, a 1968 film based off an Italian comic book character called Danger Diabolic. Ba, ba, ba.